This one. Okay. Hi. Um, welcome to Starlight Talks today. Uh, Danny Rady is joining us. Hello, um, hello everyone. Glad to be here. <laughs> um, so, um, while we're waiting for people to join, don't be afraid to check out the website, autism.com, where you can find more of my articles about living with autism. You can find um, our uh, support group that meets every other Thursday. So we're meeting tomorrow at the office and um, our social groups. And we also have Life Map, which I love. I just had my meeting today. Hmm. We meet with, um, I met with my coach today and talked about my goals for the next few months and what I'm trying to achieve. And it's been really helpful. And, um, so I do these talks every Wednesday at seven o'clock this week. It, uh, Danny Rady is the guest. <laughs> um, would you like to introduce a little bit about yourself? Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Danny Rady. I am the a lot of things these days. I'm the CEO of Asperger Experts. We are the world's largest uh, community and advocacy and training organization for people with Asperger's by people with Asperger's. And I am also the director of Acceptance and Transformational Place, a, a nonprofit retreat center over in Centralia, Washington, halfway between Portland and Seattle that uh, creates community and gathering spaces for uh, families on the spectrum to really just hang out and feel accepted. And, you know, a few other random things I'm up to these days, but those are the two major ones. So glad to be here. This is distracting. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I'm distracting. Yeah, they're very distracting. <laughs> I love dogs. <laughs> Um, so, um, I thought we'd talk a little bit about, um, the AE process and defense mode. Yeah, sure. Um, really what so, it, what it all boils down to me is, is just focusing on the fact that if people don't have enough emotional capacity, nothing is going to get done. Yeah. So, like most people think that there's a deficit in knowledge. And that like, oh, you know, we had a, a post the other day on our support group of my kids not showering. Should I like send them scientific articles on why showering is important? And I go, no, it, it, if he's not showering for either thing, it was like three months now or something, then I don't think his problem is lack of knowledge. I bet you've told him 10,000 times why showering is important. And I think that where people get stuck is just that they go, oh, it isn't work I, working. I just need to do it harder. I'm like, yeah. but, but that's not, that's not what's wrong. Yeah, I just had um, a conversation today with with Annette, my coach, um, and she was like, you you sound so confident on these talks. Like, do you ever get nervous about it? And I was like, no, not really. And she's like, well, was there ever a time where you were nervous? Like, what, or did were you always able to just speak? easily and I said no I was I was really nervous when I was little because I felt like every time I talked someone would shut me down and tell me I was wrong and so then I would I almost felt like I couldn't talk anymore not yeah. so as, and as much as people said well it's rude if you don't answer my question it's rude if you um don't say this you should talk you should that doesn't help <laughs> what yeah. helped is when I was validated and I felt comfortable enough to talk. Then I was able to talk. They were like, that. hey, Chloe, you should talk. You should talk. Chloe, why aren't you talking? You should talk. Why aren't you talking? You should talk. And then you talk and they're like, no, that was wrong. Talk this way. And you're like, I literally don't have any space to talk. Yeah. And if you give me space, now I'm afraid if I say something, you're going to basically go, well, screw you. Yeah. yeah. So it, 
That was so confusing. I was getting all these mixed signals. So I was like, well, if I don't do anything, that's probably the safest thing to do. Then I can't be wrong. Yeah. And then a lot of people then, uh, oh, she just, you know, you're being willfully defiant now. It's like. Or the, the weird one is then I'm manipulating my parents and trying to hurt them. Like, <laughs> that uh, is yeah. never. I don't get that. That's just like somebody's projecting. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it is, uh, but to me, it's it's like if we literally just focus on the fact that they aren't being a dick, they just are overwhelmed, yeah. and we keep that at the front of their mind. It's like, oh. Well, if we purchase from one angle, the story, it, like I always look at the story, right? The story is you're just uh, being willfully defiant and manipulating your parents and, and are this evil mastermind that knows exactly what you're doing and like has everybody wrapped around your finger or you're basically a cowering, scared person in the corner that nobody's taken the time to actually validate and say, I see you. Yeah. R random weird nerdy moment. Uh, I've uh, one of my weird nerdy things I've been doing lately is is trying to learn Navi from the Pandora movie um, uh, Avatar that came out in like two thousand nine, the one that like grossed over a bajillion dollars. It's an actual language, and their greeting is "Kata which means "Hello, I see you," and I love that as a greeting so much. Just because, like, hello, I see you, is that that's like that's it. That that that's all you need to do. Just like you win at that point. That's all people need is just like hello, I see you. You are valid. You are real. The end. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that's really really important for people to feel seen to feel heard that validation is really important and i feel like when it comes to autism a lot of times like when someone does something it's like you can blame it on the autism and be like don't be do it like that that's wrong because that's the autistic way where if you didn't have that there wouldn't be that blame it's just like um so you can have that blame where like, well, I shouldn't be that autistic part of me, which is really sad. Like you should be proud of that. Yeah, I mean, but I think what people do is this, they say, oh, I'm just scared to be myself because every time I do, I get shut down and stamped out. Yeah. yeah. Where in reality, it's like, okay, well, you know, I understand that, but at a certain point, you, you just need to be yourself, you know, like, and, the cool thing is, is that once you start to do that, then you find the people who like you for you, not like you for the weird contrived version that you were attempting to be. Yeah. And then you start hating yourself because now you're forced to be that type of person. And like the people are out there that really like you for you and you can do your thing and be all Asperger's and just nerd, and nerd out on the subject for the to the nth degree. And people are okay with it. Yeah, there's people out there that love that. <laughs> yes, it's it's bizarre at first, but you're like, really? Like, you want me to keep talking about this? Like, uh, I, I was over in Disney World last week because I like to go over to Disney World and hang out. And um, I was hanging out with some AE folks on uh, last Sunday in Epcot. And one of the uh, kids there, he's about 13 or so was like totally able to keep up with me as we were just going back and forth about the current construction in Epcot about how they were changing this and doing that and 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 like how they have two restaurants in the Japan Pavilion. and he's like three I'm like thank you three because I forgot the quick service restaurant and just you know really nerdy stuff but he was able to keep up with me and we could just go on and on and on and on and on and it's like it's wonderful that I can just be around people that accept me for me and and not only that but like can play that game too. And if I were trying to be somebody else and being afraid and like, uh, and you know, please don't see me, uh, then, then I wouldn't get to actually be able to have my own conversations. Mm -hmm. 
Don is saying, my son has awesome things to say if you just listen. He does not talk over people. He just won't, and he just won't be called manners. If you talk to him, he's pretty cool. Yeah. It's funny because a lot of us people with Asperger's are like the only ones that seem to, you know, actually follow the rules of manners and politeness and stuff. I'm like, oh, you know, if you give us a rule, we'll follow it. I just get frustrated when there isn't a rule to follow because I don't know, you know, so. Or there's like weird made up rules. Like I don't, when I started wearing yellow every day, like there were some people that got upset with that. That were like, you can't just wear one color. And I was like, why? <laughs> what I really mean is I'm uncomfortable with you doing something outside of what I normally know. And they just try and enforce it by, you can't do that. It's like, well, yes, I can. So if you have a problem with it, then I guess that sucks for you. I, I, I just don't even really listen to those types of people either. But, you know, once you once you get comfortable with who you are, then, yeah, sure, wear yellow all day. Eat the same thing. Everyone knows I eat tacos. That's, like, my main sustenance. And, you know, it's, it's a thing, and I enjoy it, and I have various different kinds of tacos. And I like it when I was first starting to be, uh, branch out from being in a really picky eater. I got into Mexican food because – it's the same 10 ingredients combined 20 different ways. So once you know those 10 ingredients, you're good. And you're like, oh, well, you know, how do I want it delivered? Because literally the only difference between a smothered burrito and an enchilada is that they tuck in the ends of the tortilla. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, all right, I can eat the same thing and be okay with it. And if other people aren't, then I can recognize that that's their problem and not mine. And I have zero responsibility to change it all to accommodate them. Yeah. But it takes some confidence building at first because you might drive some people away when you start to do that. Yeah, definitely. Andrea is saying, how can we help bridge the gap between neurotypical and neurodiverse people? Andrea, what do you mean by the gap? Like, what what gap are you referring to here? A gap in understanding, a, a gap in communication, a gap in, like, and uh, certain people or just, like, overall populations? To me, to me I think it's, like, um, trying to, like, put yourself in the other person's shoes. And I think yeah. the biggest mistake people make when they do that is they put themselves in the situation the other person's going through instead of remembering that person has a different way of thinking, a different past and history that they've dealt with. So they're not going to react the same as you. And so when you go, well, in that situation, I wouldn't have said something that rude. Then you start to make assumptions like, oh, that person's cold or that person's like this, where if you actually talk to them and ask questions about why did you do that? I don't understand. And it bothers me a little. Then you get to know, well, I did it for this reason. You go, oh, my God, I would have never thought that. And you get yeah. um, more of an understanding of that person. And just I, and, and I feel like a lot of like the reliance on closing that gap goes on the autistic person where like I remember part of the reason I didn't talk is both I was I heard things incorrectly and I said things incorrectly and the yeah. other person never said anything incorrectly or never heard anything incorrectly I always felt like it was me that was being blamed mm -hmm. and so in a conversation if someone misheard it's it's there's two people at fault in that situation. You need to make sure the other person is getting your point as yeah. well as you're getting their point. It also just has to come down to a lot of times of just shared language. Uh, I was having a conversation with some staff uh, at Asperger Experts today, and we were talking about people's stuff, as in, like, it was, it was particularly around money, but we were just in general, you know, people have stuff around this. And we realized that we had two different definitions of the word stuff because the guy I was talking to said, you know, I think that everyone's always has stuff around money. And I'm like, I disagree. I think that there's a certain point where you don't have stuff, but 
he was referring to stuff as just an idea, and I was referring stuff to as like something that you are triggered by, which is completely different concepts. And that's where I find a lot of the breakdowns in families are: is go take out the trash. I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. They're both right, but one person's definition of take out the trash is take out the bag and put it in the the bin. And the other person is just take out the bag and put it in the bin and the recycling and bring everything down the street and put new bags in the, the cans. So, but if you don't make that clear, then you get issues because all of a sudden, you know, one person saying I did and the other person saying, no, you didn't, but you never took time to actually identify what take out the trash means. Yeah. Yeah. There, um, me, um, in my, um, English class, I remember like debating like what words meant like in high school with my friends and like, we like enjoyed doing that. And I think that's like why we understand each other so well. And we'd yeah. be, right? yeah. Cause like you can get into each other's heads. So like, we'd be like reading one of our English books together and we'd be like, what does this mean? And then it would like be boiled down to like this one word where we're all, we all have completely different definitions. So like, and like that changed so much of like what we read. It was really interesting when we had those discussions. Yeah. Um, and then I think that as well, um, that also just, you know, makes it clear that there isn't some objective written in stone existing somewhere outside of yourself definition that is the capital T true definition. It's, and I think that's what a lot of, of people, both Asperger's and not don't understand is that not the word means whatever we all agree it means. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as long as we can agree on the same thing, that's what matters rather than looking for some right way to, that something should be something that a way that something should be the word, the way that the word is defined. It's like, yeah, but this is what it is in the dictionary. Yeah. One of many different dictionaries of which they all have different definitions. So, you know, and then as time passes, words change. We're like literally used to only mean literally. And now it also means not literally the opposite. You Literally. can use it. Yeah. It, I saw a uh, really good comedy bit from a British guy that said the most confusing word in the English language is ass. Because you can say, you can use it oh, as I like half ass. Like, but you can't quarter <laughs> ass. And it was, it, it was, it was really funny. Um, yeah. There's but, so many words we have that has way too many meanings yeah. or words that sound similar. <laughs> yeah. And yet we wonder why, you know, we get confused because someone with Asperger's is like, okay, so literally means literally, right? And we all go, yeah, that's the definition. But then we change it to go, and we change the definition. Okay, what's the new definition? Literally the exact opposite of literally. And I mean that literally. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, Okay, wait, but you just said it was, but then it's, yeah. And I think the problem is, is that we're thinking too literally. You know, we assume like that there is one set of rules, which is partly culture's uh, problem because culture sort of says that there is one right way to do things and run right, one right way to do X, Y, and Z. And so we sort of get this idea that there is the way, the capital T, capital W, the way. When in reality, that's never the case. There is never just one way to do something. Because if you look in any form of like natural law and natural systems, nature does not do a way. Nature has many, 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 many different ways, simply because, you know, just having one thing is prone to it dying. So we have many different ways of, of doing things because that, you know, that diversity is good. So 
Kat says, my daughter has communication issues. She argues she does not. She's in the here now, not past, not future. It's difficult because to her it's fine. Everything is literal. Never say 7.30 if it's 7.28. Um, she does have a point there because communication is a tool of specificity and separation. That's what it does, right? If you say, if I ask what time it is and it's 7.40 and you say it's 7.45, like, you're assuming that I, uh, a lot of things, why did you not just say it's 740? Like, why are you rounding up? To me, that's extremely irritating as well, because maybe I needed to know exactly what time it was, because maybe I wanted to know if I had five minutes left to do a thing or not. So, like, she has a point there of, like, understanding that at its core, communication is a tool for specificity and separation. So using it as some like arbitrary thing is like, why would you do this? You obviously don't understand what the tool is to be used for. But at the same time, to say there is also a time for speaking around things because there's a lot of stuff that can't be discussed or measured just simply because we don't have the words or tools for it. So you can only sort of talk around it in the same way that you measure a black hole only by looking at how light bends around it. You can't actually see it. And yet I think that's, that's something I had trouble with for the longest time. Like there's this whole other realm of things that you can't point to and you can't really describe. So you have to talk around and describe around. The... For me, the, the easiest uh, thing for that was looking at architecture and seeing that if I want to define how a room is made up, it's not made of four walls, it's made out of four 90 degree angles. So like pointing to the angles and saying there's the relationship and understanding that it's more about how things relate to one another than it is about the thing itself really helped me. Help me become less literal and more able to see, okay, it's more about the relationship of things. Um, oh, yeah. What I write uh, a lot of scripts and dialogue, and my, people really talk in, like, circles. They, like, skirt around things instead of ta talking directly about it a lot of times. And that's some of my favorite comedy bits is because you're not – straightforward enough the other person assumes you're talking about something completely different and that's yeah. where like comedy comes into place is they're both characters are talking about something completely different and think they're talking about the same thing and that happens all the time because people aren't don't put in an, an enough specifics and detail and aren't straightforward with and what I, they're talking uh, about. yeah then when we do then they somehow go like, you're being too blunt or something. Mm -hmm. Although for a lot of people, they're like, hey, I, I value your communication. I'm like, I didn't know that I was this master communicator that you think I am, but okay. And I think that people think I'm some sort of master communicator just because I, I call it like it is, I'm direct. And you know, I, all I'm doing is just being direct and not talking around something that doesn't need to be talked around. I'm hungry and would like to get dinner. It's like, okay, well, that's blunt. What do you want? I've, I've thought about this. And, like, generally my answer is now Indian, Mexican, or Thai. And, like, I, I know what I want and, I'm, and I will describe my needs and describe my wants. And, like, if I'm on a long car ride with people, I will be like, hey, FYI, I am feeling the need to... to uh, drink some water and I don't have any water. So the next 30 minutes, can we pull over and get some water? Whereas most people won't be like that direct. They'll just be like, I'm thirsty. And it's just something I've had to learn how to do. Speaking of which. <laughs> um, well, I've gotten um, compliments on how articulate I am, but it normally ends with for someone so young or for someone with autism or for like, there's always like a weird end of it. Where I'm like, yeah, like, you couldn't be this way, but you are like, I've gotten a lot of like, 
you are you've gotten a lot of training done at your young age i'm like i guess okay sure but i think that a lot of people just have a very small idea of what things should be and then if you deviate from that small idea they're like what they're either like you suck or wow you did something really different here so Cat, this says, mine can't understand what it wants. I'm hungry, gets I don't know what I want, then frustration. Cat, generally, I found that's because uh, a lot of times I didn't know what I wanted when I couldn't feel my body or my feelings. Because when you ask somebody, like, if you ask somebody what they want to eat, it's, where do you, what do you feel like eating tonight? Where do you feel like going out to eat? Notice the word feel is in there, right? It's not, what rational thought do you have about eating tonight? It's where do you feel like eating? And if you quite literally do not feel, if you're disconnected from how you feel, then you quite literally don't know how you feel, and then you don't know what you want to eat. Um, when I was little, I didn't understand what signals my body was telling me. So when I was hungry, I would go to my parents and say, my stomach hurt. And that was me telling them I was hungry because I didn't understand that that meant I needed food or maybe I did, didn't know how to communicate it. But like, so there's also like connecting that and connecting to language yeah. that- I'm like, oh, you mean that this feeling is the thing that everyone calls hunger, got it, yeah. okay. Yeah. And then you like start eating whenever you feel that way and you're like, wow, this is awesome. Where like I remember for so long, um, I didn't understand that period cramps were different from like cramps you get when like you're running or exercising. You know, you get like that side ache. And I was like, this doesn't I, feel I, the do same. So I thought it was completely different. I'm like, why do they have the same name? They don't feel the same. Yeah, and so people ask really me if I have cramps. I'm like, no, but I have like a weird stomach ache. And they're like, cramps. <laughs> Like, no, I don't have that. I, I wish I could say I, I know how you feel. I don't. <laughs> but, like, there's so many things that have the same name that aren't the same thing. <laughs> it, that does frustrate me. That I know how you feel. That I'm like, really, you guys? You couldn't have chosen a better word for this? Like, these two are, like, entirely different things. And yet you're just, like, grouping them under the same name. Like, do we not know what the purpose of communication is? It's, it frustrates me. Like, I'm learning a lot about design. Um, so it frustrates me when people don't know, like, why design is a thing. Like, hey, you know that when you design a thing, you use it, you design it for, like, a purpose, usually for communication, if you're designing a visual thing. So, like, people that just make something that looks pretty without knowing that they're communicating stuff, I'm like, you went to design school for like 10 years and you still don't know like the fundamental principle of design. What? So yeah, it's, it's weird. I, I feel like I live in a different world, but not like I'm an alien. Like there are some very basic, like stupid, if you say them basic things that I feel like a lot of people don't understand. And it, it frustrates me to no end. My apartment complex turns on the TVs in the common room that I have to pass by because they say it makes the space more alive. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. It does the exact opposite of that. It, it makes the space more dead because now I don't want to go in there when the TV's blaring all the time. And it like frustrates me that we have such opposite definitions of, the, of a space being alive. Yeah. Um, or like when you're like defining your definition of something and the other person like that's incorrect. <laughs> like, you're like, no. and, and who made you the declarer of truth here? We can have I, different I, opinions and they can both be right. <laughs> yeah, there's, yes, there's a thing called opinions. We can indeed both be right. I saw a trailer for a movie uh, Glass today. It was a superhero movie uh, directed by M. Night Shyamalan. 
And the beginning starts out with, I am a psychologist who specializes in the unique delusion of grandeur. Then you are all here because you have the wrong belief that somehow you are superheroes. I'm like, who cares? If these people believe that they're superheroes, let them believe that. As long as it isn't like harming other people and they're just like, I'm Superman. Great. You go be Superman. Like, People get this little stick up various parts of their body because they they like have to enforce this one way of being, and we're all going. But it doesn't impact you, so go away. And then you wonder why sometimes we don't talk because then you're like, no, that's wrong. I'm like, well, then you just don't get to be a part of my life. Sorry. You know? Yeah. But I think as, as everyone's saying in the comments here, we are speaking the same language, English, but we're also like, that's not enough. Yeah. You have to make sure that your words mean the same things. Not just, you know, like semi the same thing. I saw a, um, a uh, video by uh, Vsauce on YouTube. It, is my red the same as your red? And I was like, that is a very interesting question. And how does one even like prove that? Like, we can both say that this is blue, but is my blue the same as your blue or have we just learned to associate the word with a certain wavelength of light that filters through our eyes? I have no idea if you see this completely differently than I do. This may be your red. I have no way of, of you know, knowing that, but as long as we can maintain some uh, agreement on that, I don't really care because we can both agree that this is blue for whatever that means. Somebody's asking, why is there a need to be so literal? My son corrects everything constantly and annoys his friends. How can I help him? Uh, because as I was saying earlier, at least for me, communication is a tool for specificity. If it's 728 and I ask what time it is and you say 730, I'm going to get frustrated because you could have easily been more specific and you didn't. And the goal of communication is to be specific. So why did you not? Chloe, do you share that? Yeah, to me, it's like, I don't understand what you said. Please try again for me to understand. Like, he's trying to help himself. He's like, well, if you use the words correctly, then I'll understand your meaning. Yeah. And I know I do that more than people like. I'm like, please repeat. I don't know what you meant by that. Say it a different which, way. Which because is why I you saying, uh, how do I bridge the gap? And I just go, what do you mean yeah. by that? Because that meant, could have meant 10,000 different things. Yeah, and like people can be so, so vague. I hate vague questions. Like I remember when I was little, someone would ask me like, how was your day? I would go through like literally every little event that happened in the day because I didn't know how to answer that question. Yeah. Like, what does that mean? A day is so big. <laughs> I, I love it when people ask me, like, uh, just like, oh, did you meet anyone new today? And I go, yes. Who were they? I'm like, what are you asking for in that question? Do you just want me to give a random name? Do you want me to, like, give you a whole, like, background bi biography of the person? Like, we're on the phone here. I'm, I'm telling you about somebody I met. You're asking who are they, like, or what was their name? It's like, what what is that? Why? <laughs> that, that, you know, I didn't see the purpose of your question. What are you actually asking? And that, that you know, confuses me. If somebody was asking, how do you do this? Sit down with a pad and a piece of paper and go through the words you use with your family and come up with common definitions. That, that's how you do it. Yeah. Um, and you, you have a lot of words that you created that gave us a language, like yeah. being able to say that I'm in defense mode, I'm having a sensory overload or shutdown, like yeah. able to like 
specify that in, where before I was just like, I don't feel well today or I'm tired. And yeah. that just like, well, my parents are like, well, if you're, you can't miss school just because you're tired. And now I can yeah. be like, well, I'm not tired. <laughs> I didn't know that there was another word and something yeah. more specific I could say. And when I then had that and they understood what it was, I could communicate. Well, right now, everything's so overwhelming. I can't handle school. I won't be able to learn or process or pay attention. And if I'm allowed time to stay home and rest and have some peace, then I can go back to school and it'll be fine and I'll be able to get the most out of it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's sort of the, the expert level is creating words when there are none. Something that we totally didn't create, but we use is spoons. The, the, I the love script, that. Right? The, the, if, if you don't know what we're talking about, um, Google spoon theory, and you'll find many articles about it. But so we were sitting around the campfire a few weeks ago at Acceptance, the uh, campground and community place I run over in Centralia. And somebody just totally was just like, oh, and then I ran out of spoons and everyone's like, uh-huh. And then she just stops and goes, can I just say how awesome it is that I didn't need to explain what I meant just there and that, that you all just like immediately get what I'm talking about? And it was like, oh, yeah, we know what, we know what spoons are. <laughs> because if you say that to somebody who doesn't know, they're like, what do you mean you ran out of spoons? Why didn't you just like, why don't you have enough spoons? You go, you just go to the store and get more spoons. You know, they usually come in like packs of four, so you just see how many you need and like get like service for like 16 or something. You have enough spoons, right? And you're like, no, that's that's not at all what we're talking about. I'm not talking about a spoon. I'm talking about like emotional capacity. Like, then why'd you say spoons? It's like, well, because that's what I meant. But having that separate language um, is, uh, is something entirely different. That, and that allows you to communicate things that you don't normally have words for. Mm -hmm. I, in, my con in my conversations that are sort of around uh, cultural stories, and I'm doing a lot of work now related to uh, the different cultural perspectives that we have in the U.S., I've had to, like, create this whole language of, like, monocultural puritanism 2.0 is one of the things I'm now saying of like the idea that the, that came from uh, Puritan belief about like repression and how we've made that sort of the monoculture idea about work in the U.S. But I had no way to like explain that. So I had to like make up words and language around that. So I think, you know, making up language, even if it's just nonsensical like spoons, completely great. Um, Donna has a question that I probably won't be able to answer. Um, Gail, if, if you're there and you want to jump in on this, I have a nonverbal granddaughter. How do you teach them to go potty on the potty? <laughs> um, how, how old is your granddaughter? Hi, I'm Chloe's mom. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the I, background here. We're, we are really... Uh, able to answer questions about potty training because I haven't, I don't have a kid, haven't done that yet. So um, anyway. Uh, All right, well, uh, if you post post what age she is and um, if I don't get to you tonight, uh, maybe I'll, I'll uh, send you a, an email <laughs> with, with my thoughts. Yeah. Um, I know that I had a lot of issue with that and it, um, for me, I, I, explained it to um my mom we actually using this this spoon theory she's like i didn't i don't understand because you knew how bad it could get if you didn't go so why didn't you i know it's painful to go but why didn't you just suffer through it i'm like because i had to suffer through school and so much other stuff i ran out of spoons to just go to the bathroom <laughs> yeah. like for me that was a really hard experience is and then at school they had these automatic flushing toilets, which I was terrified of. And so I refused to go at school. And I actually went, went a couple of times in my pants at school because of this. Um, and then the really nice nurse was like, I have a 
toilet in the nurse's office that you can come to that does not have that. And so I would walk all the way there. And I had teachers that would get mad that I did that. But I'd be like, I don't care. I have to go. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where I'm going. At that point. So um, it's not me. always about like teaching them like you should go poop. Like there might be another reason that's preventing that from happening. So make sure they're comfortable with everything in the bathroom that they're they have the capacity to go to the bathroom. Exactly, that they right? You yeah. know, all that sort of stuff. It, it, nine times out of ten, it comes down to do they have the resources? And, and nine yeah. times out of ten, the is no, they don't. Um, Donna's saying seven years old. So nonverbal and seven years old. And, like, are they still in diapers 100% of the time? Or are they still, like, just afraid of auto-flushing toilets? Or what degree are we talking about here? And I think what Chloe was talking about really touched on a lot of what may be the other underlying issues of going to the bathroom in the toilet. It may be the fear of the toilet. It may be um, overwhelmed with other things. And that's just the last thing that um, that he wants to do. Uh, he ran out of spoons. I mean, there's so it's, it, I really think she kind of touched on what else it might be. Um, yeah. So and, I'd start uh, there. Off. I'd start there. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really just any loud noise or something takes a lot of, of capacity. Like, I'll give you an example right now, live in the moment. So <laughs> I have a little canker sore on my lip right here. And whenever I drink water, it's actually really painful to do so for a second because it like touches, it's just like. You know when you have a, a, a mouth sore and then anything touches it and it starts like stinging when anything touches it? Like, so yes. whenever, I take a sip of water, <laughs> whenever I take a sip of water now, like it stings for the entire length of time that I'm doing that. It stings pretty darn a lot. So like just doing that right now took a lot of emotional capacity just to handle and deal with the pain of the stinging that's coming from this darn thing that needs to go away already. But like, oh my God. if You're I so had no capacity, I just like wouldn't be drinking thing. water. <laughs> right? I, um, I had an operation on my mouth, like, and they nicked like every inch of my mouth and I had sores all over. So I understand. <laughs> yeah. And then you're just like, well, I guess I'm just not going to eat for a month then. Yeah. And then, like, you keep biting it even though you're trying to avoid it. It's just. It's like, ah! And it just becomes, like, like, a thing. And so for me, the only reason why I am able to still drink a good amount of water is because I have enough emotional capacity to tolerate that. Sometimes if straws lower, help. <laughs> if you can get the straw in the right spot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, otherwise, it would be like, I have to like numb my mouth and use a straw to like talk like this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but the only reason why I'm able to just like be fine with all of this is because I have enough emotional capacity. I have enough spoons to be able to take that pain and yeah. still, you know, talk with you and do everything else that I'm doing and be fine with it. If I was having a bad day, that would like put me over the edge and I'd be like dehydrated and annoyed. And then, you know, it's just everything that comes from that and be like, oh my God, just no. So it, it, it's, it might just be an issue of like lack of capacity to deal with the things. And yeah, Kat, I, I have some of that. Um, but, you know, I, I don't like to use it because then my mouth gets numb and that's a whole other set of problems because I don't like feeling like I have a, a numb mouth because oh, I stop talking like this. It's like, hello, 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 and because, you know, I can't control it. <laughs> So with that being said, I'm going to go back to suffering here. <laughs> mm. 
and you know just deal with it. Um, Donna was saying she's able to okay a little bit TMI here, but she's able to go number two, but sometimes she doesn't know how to pee. <laughs> we talk about all sorts of things on here. <laughs> um, doesn't know. Uh, let, let's get more specific here. Doesn't know how to or doesn't do it in the appropriate receptacle, meaning in her pants versus in the in the in the toilet. Because there is a big difference between the literal lack of knowledge of doing the activity, which I don't even think is a, is a thing because your body knows how to do it. It's not like you need to learn before you can, right? It's it, it happens whether or, you know or it or not. Does not recognize in enough time when she has to go, or does she not want to do it in the bathroom? Like, there's so many different reasons. Yeah, and, and the specificity is key, is key yeah. here because uh, doesn't know how to is very different from gets off too early, which is very different than doesn't recognize the sensations I'm, of I am about to, which is very different than just doesn't pay attention to it, which is very different to doesn't value it, which is very different to has a, uh, you know, uh, the AI, which is very different than, you know, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So you'd approach those entirely differently. If she has a UTI versus if she just gets off too early, those are like, in, one is take antibiotics and the other one is wait longer. So, you know, and and the specificity there really is the key. I have people come to me and be like, my kid is has, has ADD and can't focus on homework at all. And he just, he can't focus. He has a hard time focusing. I go, really, what does he do when he gets home? Oh, he plays Minecraft for five hours straight. So does he ever take breaks? No. Does he ever do anything else? So I say, no. Can you get him off? No, it's hard to get him off. So basically what you're telling me is, he focuses on Minecraft for five hours. Sounds like he can focus just fine. The problem is not his, his ability to focus. He has no issues with focusing. He just doesn't want to do the homework because he rightfully sees it as useless. Which is a very different problem than my kid can't focus, which is give them ADD meds. My kid thinks homework is stupid. Don't give them ADD meds, right? <laughs> It's like, oh, my kid thinks homework is stupid. Medicate them. What? It, it doesn't make sense now. It's like, well, you know, A, they're right. No scientific study has ever been able to prove an, uh, prove an effective homework. But this is sort of when you tell them that it's stupid, but you still need to do it. You know? Which is, again, a very different thing than... They can't focus. And if you just stop there, you go to the doctor and go, they can't focus and they get ADD meds and that's not the problem at all. So like keep drilling down into that. Excuse me while I continue to suffer here. <laughs> um, so if she's doing it in her pants, Donna, then honestly it may just be that she doesn't, she isn't aware of it. She doesn't have just like, you know, I'm my stomach hurts versus I'm hungry. There we go. See, if we keep digging, we get to the real tooth of what's going in. She holds it in a lot till she can't anymore. <laughs> so, why does she hold it in a lot? Right? We start like very different than the my how do I potty train my seven year old? Now we're getting into well, she holds it in a lot, and then, and, and as we were just talking about here, are there evil auto flushing toilets somewhere in her life? You know, like is there something else? Is there some other reason why she holds it in a lot? Like I know for me, like whenever I'm camping, I hold it in just because I don't want to get up at three a.m. when it's really cold and like put on everything and go to the bathroom, like walk over there, find the flashlight, and it's this whole like event where I'd like rather just like be dehydrated all night and then not have to pee and then wake up in the morning and drink a lot of water. So. Danny. You know, 
Yeah. Um, while we're talking about camping, would you share a little bit about acceptance with? Um, yes, I did. Um, with our audience. So a few years ago, actually, uh, when you guys went on our retreat in 2016, yeah, 2016. Yep. Uh, in 2016, uh, we really started to come to the conclusion of the idea that one of the best things you can do is really just gather people together, not for some specific structured purpose of like therapy or workshop or learning, but just to gather people together so that we can all hang out. And so I determined we really need a place where we can do that. So uh, since then, I've been working to create a nonprofit and build a retreat center where people can come and gather and feel accepted. And um, so that is acceptance over in Centralia, Washington. We are now working to raise money to purchase land so that we can begin construction on building a retreat center specifically designed for people to come and hang out in just, you know, have conversations like this. Like this is where the valuable work comes into play, right? We didn't plan any of this conversation. What are we going to talk about beforehand? Well, let's talk about, communication for 30 minutes and then peeing for another 10 after that we're just talking and hanging out with people and that's to me like the value of of this just hanging out and talking with other people and having a good conversation so we're building a physical place to allow that to happen and in the meantime we're going to be running uh retreats like we did in thailand but all over the world where we can just gather like-minded folk to just hang out for a week. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. And, and it's what we do also at Artism is is yeah. social groups. Um, you know, and, and you found see, value like, you in just them, hanging right? out. Just like yeah. When people just hang out together, not for some like therapeutic purpose, but just to hang out together it changes lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. saw that on the retreat we did in Thailand, like hanging out for like a week with people in a private resort where you, you don't really need to leave. You do occasionally, but you don't really need to like does wonders. Like you hang out for two hours and people are like, wow, that was amazing. Imagine what happens when you hang out for a week straight with folks, you know, mm -hmm. Cat, email me, Danny at AspergerExperts.com. If, if you're serious about it, we, we have a group together that we are uh, working on, uh, you know, figuring out how to purchase land and stuff. So email me. Um, I remember in at school we did outdoor ed where you'd go camping for a week with your grade. And everyone dreaded the trip, but I loved it because I felt like everyone really bonded and connected because we just hung out for a week and did things that challenged us um, yeah. that was outside our comfort zone. And so we were all supporting each other, which is not a normal middle school experience. <laughs> but that's the key, right? Something outside of your comfort zone so that you are forced to sort of support each other. Weird, odd story on the flight coming back from Orlando on Monday. Um, when we were about to take off, like us in the back rows, we all started going, what is that noise? There was some like weird ocean type noise. And like more and more people around us started, going, what is that noise? I don't know, what is that noise? And we all started talking and like, what the hell is that? And then somebody like eventually was like, hey, is that you? Yeah, somebody had put their wave machine on but not plugged their headphones all the way in. So it was going <sighs> to the whole like, six rows around me and then when they finally plugged it in people were like they all started clapping because <laughs> it and i was thinking i'm like i feel in a weird way closer to these random strangers now just because we all had to admittedly deal with the rather first world problem of a wave machine annoying us but still the you know it, it was what it was So because of that, like having that space where you can all support each other and talk and, and, you know, have that space just to like hang out does magic. Even if it's just everyone rallying against somebody with a wave machine on, <laughs> but, you know, more than that. Um, there's this question that Glenda Olson had that said that her 
14 year old is finally showing signs of social skill improvement. You both seem to have a sense of humor, which he has very little of. At what age do you think you began to have a sense of humor? Um, what I understand about humor is that humor is actually something that you learn that you're not you're not born with that that you like that's why everyone has such a different kind of humor based on how you deal with things where i know like people use humor when they're uncomfortable and i know people use humor to like meet people and like there's all different ways and people find different things funny um and so, like, depending on who you're around and what you're going through, there, I think humor is very, very different for everyone. And so if he doesn't feel like he's in a place where humor is acceptable, then he's not going to use it and he's not going to find things very funny. So maybe he's going through something that doesn't allow for him to find things funny because like if you're for some reason when you're like somewhere like a funeral people find you'll find people that find it really inappropriate for you to crack a joke and there's other people that can't help but make jokes because they're so uncomfortable that they're cracking jokes so if you're one of those people who can't laugh in that situation there, you're not going to find anything funny, even if there's a comedian there who's making the funniest jokes in the world. So well, I feel like he's in a situation where he's not going to find anything funny or maybe he has a different kind of humor than you. Yeah. Where he's going to find something really different funny from you. So you're not yeah. going to see him laugh when you crack a joke or at the things you find funny. I. I sort of have a, a, the opposite approach to that of I have uh, a very sometimes sick sense of humor <laughs> and it is not appropriate usually to, to find those things funny in public. So like people think I have a very different sense of humor than I actually have because like I have a very morbid sense of humor <laughs> that like I would find a funeral hilarious for some reason, but that is like extremely inappropriate. So I would secretly find it a funeral hilarious and not actually, you know, like express that just because I know that I don't want to piss off other people. But that also may be a thing if he may have such a different type of humor that he, that he has gotten shut down for it so many times that like he just, doesn't display his humor anymore. Um, yeah. And my dad is sort of like that where he doesn't, he, he'll watch something he thinks is really funny. And like, I've shown him like my own stuff. That's um, my own scripts and my own videos that are com comedies. And at the end of it, he looks at me and goes, that was hilarious. <laughs> And he really thinks it was funny, but had no reaction throughout watching it or reading it. But he's then he looks at me and goes, that was the funniest thing ever. You should write more of these jokes. And I'm like, but you didn't laugh. He's like, but it was funny. I don't have to laugh for it to be funny. Reach like, his own, you know? Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. And and I believe him. He genuinely thinks things are funny, but ha doesn't show it on his face. And I think that not everyone does show it with their body, that they can still feel it. So maybe yeah. he, doesn't, he also doesn't show it in the same way. Yeah. Um, somebody was asking how they find more info about the retreat. Uh, the website is findacceptance.com. So if you go to findacceptance.com, then you should find us because that is our website. Um, um, uh, well, it's eight o'clock, so I think I'm gonna start wrapping up. Yeah, um, we, we but can go forever. Hey, yeah, we if, sure. <laughs> if you do want to go forever, then you know, like come to one of their social events or come to one of uh, acceptances 
retreats and, and we can just yammer all day long. <laughs> um, so thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Danny, for joining the Starlight no Talks. <laughs> um, and co guys, come back next week. Um, come back next week. Um, uh, Adam Walsh will be joining us talking about moments in time and that sort of stuff. Um, uh, check out the website, support groups happening tomorrow. Uh, I love support group. Hi, <laughs> me again. Um, tomorrow's support group is for those with Asperger's, adults with Asperger's. And we actually are just starting our first one uh, the follow following Thursday for parents or and caregivers. So check out our oh, website. Yeah. Yeah, the parent support group coming. Um, and then as, as I shared this uh, to after breakfast, do you want to share, uh, tell where you're located for people that don't know? If they're watching oh yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Artism.com. And we're in located in Redondo beach, California. Um, uh, we, um, check out life map. That's, um, our main thing we do. And I'm, uh, love being part of that um and we have like a lot of things coming in the future workshops mentoring um so stick around <laughs> so stay colorful <laughs> bye